Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I actually been thinking about doing this video for a while on my thoughts regarding Dr. Umar Johnson and why he is no longer considered a threat to the white power structure. At one point he was though. Um, but I think it's very clear now that he is no longer a threat. Now, it's not to say that he is not on the radar, right? There are a good handful of people who have been placed on what one would say the radar of the powers that be, that control the system, or the many systems, shall I say, that are at play. And before we begin to break down my thoughts on why Dr. Omar Johnson is no longer a threat to the system, let's talk about a little bit about first who Dr. Umar Johnson is, what his mission was, and I say that very cautiously. And what made it such a threat, right? And, and looking at, first of all, how things are set up within our society, right? Like, I think it should be very clear that there is an agenda um, set up to keep a group of people, shall I say groups of people, in a certain place while another group of people stay in a different place, right? That system, as we all know it, is the system of quote-unquote white supremacy. Now, it's funny because I used to date this person, my partner I dated of three years. He will say, you know, I'm not calling it the system of white supremacy. I'm just going to call it a system of what it is. By the way, this Clearly, is an audio recording. So, for those who are wondering, like, I can't see you. Where's your face? Listen, it is after ten o'clock on a Sunday night. I do have patience to see tomorrow, so I'm just gonna make this an audio uh, recording. Um, right, because I, I think in saying calling it the system of white supremacy, though that's their intent. Their intent is to remain supreme, to uh, continue to perpetuate this strategic uh, system that is interwoven in many different facets of our well-being and survival, right? Uh, I think it's important the words that we use, and I, I definitely understand where my ex-partner was coming from when he said that he's not going to call it a system of white supremacy because we give it power when we do that. But at the same time, I think it's important to call things as they are. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, the system of what it is, or the system of white supremacy is multi-layered and I think that we undermine the intricacies of it right we don't we don't really I think I think naturally we are oblivious and kind of dumbfounded to the extent which this system negatively impacts us and affects us on so many different levels, right? I like the way Tariq Nasheed laid it out in his documentary series, Hidden Colors. I think it was part five where he talked about the different um, prongs of this system, how it affects uh, us in education, how it affects us in the medical healthcare system, Right, we're being attacked in so many different ways. How we, how our relationships, how the family, the black family dynamic is being impacted. Right. 
Um, Dr. Umar Johnson, his mission essentially was to, he's, I mean, him having the background of a school psychologist and then he went on to become a, a clinical psychologist, his focus was with children and with families, uh, specifically with young children, right? And he often quotes Frederick Douglass, who says that it's better to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. Um, and I definitely get where he's coming from in that because it's like once you get to a certain age, you're almost at the point of no return or it's much more difficult to kind of reshape and recondition that, that mind, right? Even at the age of five years old, we're already tainted. You know, which my research study uh, builds upon prior research that was pioneered by uh, Kenneth and Henry Clark, where they assess implicit racial bias in children as young as five years old, preliterate age. Already at that age, our minds very feeble, easily uh, manipulated and malleable, easily conditioned. Have already been shaped. So imagine you who are listening to this at your age of 25 or 29, 31, 36, 45, how much your mind has been shaped, right? You look at the mind as a computer, how much information has come into your mind, therefore shaping your DNA, the person that you are. And especially in the age we live in now, in social media, we call it the information age, right? But it's, it's more than just information. Like the way they use technology and we obviously have voluntarily given them permission, right? To access every aspect of our, our lives, right? There's no, <laughs> there's no sense of privacy where privacy was something that we value, we protected and we, we cherish. It's gone out the window, right? And just with the, the, the touch of a button, the, the touch of our fingertips, our fingerprint, a reflection of our identity, right? Part of the matrix. And it, it gets very, uh, this topic, I think, um, is very sensitive in nature. And it makes sense why I think it really hasn't been addressed in such a way that uncovers the real truth of what's happening, right? I think people, they have a sense of what's happening, right? They're conscious leaders. There are people who are influencers on social media that want to bring forth the truth. But I think many people's expression of the truth has been muzzled to a certain extent for their own protection and I think with Dr. Umar Johnson he is no different I think he's playing a game of uh, not just currently but for so long he has been playing this game and I think you know he knows best his, his spirit his soul knows best what he has been through right we can set out on a mission and this mission is driven by our own need for uh, survival, right? We all have, should have innately within us this drive to adapt, to survive, to overcome any obstacle and really at any cost, right? To fight to the death if need be. But oftentimes that uh, drive for survival is suppressed and i think we've seen that many times over especially with these uh attack campaigns that have been brought forth against dr Omar johnson uh, attempts to attack his his character his mission right uh there has been a string of uh, defamation of character attacks against dr Omar johnson on social media um, that I think I would say have been proven to be successful. 
um, successful in an extent where people have bought into what is being said about him, right? Thinking back to what was said about him regarding the whole conscious stripper incident, right? I mean, there's so many different ways to look at this, but I think, you know, as with a lot of men, you know, it's like <laughs> they have weaknesses and clearly that's one of his weaknesses, you know, being prone to give in to his own natural fleshly desires. He's a man, right? That doesn't make him a, a criminal or less of a righteous person that he, you know, wants to get his own sexual needs met, right? And I think that's obviously where he came about with these whole slogans, uh, consciousness over, over coochie and politics over punani, um, to set his own mind in the proper context, right? For what needs to be done, prioritizing the mission over, you know, messing around with different women. That's clear, right? And when we look at the most recent events that have taken place where the rapper, very vulgar, sexually explicit, sexually exploitative rapper, Sukiani, who I had no nothing about um, up until the OK Osiris uh, incident, um, that was brought to light. I knew nothing about her, right? Because I tend to detach myself from what's happening in the news, what are the, you know, current trends. I don't really keep up with that. Um, but some things, you know, they push for you to see, right? So it's inescapable for you to be able to not see it so to speak. So, you know, it came across my purview and I'm like, interesting. I heard about how she had kind of solicited her interest in him. She expressed her, her interest in him publicly and he took the bait. He took the bait and I was brought back to remember, um, my own experience with this back in California, something similar happened, right? And, and looking at the pictures that he just posted of himself and Sukiani back you know, when they were in Miami just over the weekend, he seems so happy, so exuberant, right? You look on the, the smile on his face, it's almost like the smile of an innocent little boy in a candy store. Right or at Disney World, you know, not a clue, right? Just the innocence of his face, like, oh my gosh, like almost like I got a chance to meet Sukiani. Whereas you look at the the look on her face, it's like, okay, I got this nigga. And we know that he is politically conscious, even the most politically astute leaders have become victim to their own ignorance, you know, to their own detriment based on their own careless decisions, right? And actions. And I think he sought out with well intention to collaborate with her, right? And, and of course he has a brand with an accompanying uh, following, she has a, a massive brand, I think, which would be 10 times larger than his with her following. And, you know, I think he was thinking along the lines of, okay, we collaborate, we come together. This could be something great. You know, I could leverage her following because they're cross-promoting. She, they, you know, it's like they, they did the photo op in Miami. So with the photos that they each have, she's posted the photos on her, her social media. He's posted the photos on his social media. 
right? So people that didn't know anything about her on his following now know about her and vice versa. So I think it could be a blessing and a curse. I think it's more so a curse. I think that this whole opportunity that he thought in his mind was such a great opportunity has set him backwards. Um, but that's just one piece of this conversation. Even before that particular collaboration, I was like, it, it was evident to me, like I saw very clearly that he is no longer a threat. We look at the things that he stood for when he first hit the scene. I think he first came out, his first interview, I think, well, maybe was back in 2010. A very long time ago. That seems so long ago, right? Almost 14, 15 years ago. Um, I think he came out in 2009. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. Feel free to drop the exact month and year when Dr. Umar stepped out on the scene. I know he talks about uh, how New York City played a major role and he did an interview uh, that made that went viral, right? And really put him out on the forefront. He talks about that that one interview. I think it was a radio interview that he did. Uh, and then things just you know skyrocketed from there I remember when I first learned about who Dr. Omar Johnson was it was through my ex-partner back in 2014 um, on our first date he had invited me to his place and he put on the Hidden Colors documentary series and we were watching it and I'm listening to Dr. Omar Johnson just speak so powerfully and passionately about these these issues that impact the black community and it resonated with me i'm just like man this man is on fire i love his energy he stood out not only for that reason but obviously because he's a psychologist and i'm a psychologist now at the time i was you know working towards becoming a psychologist but you know, I graduated with my PhD in 2021, just a couple of years ago. So, of course, I identify with his career path. And I'm like, he's a man, right? He just, he just stood out amongst all of the other, um, all the other speakers that were part of the documentary series. Like, he definitely, his light definitely shined very bright. And... From there, I began to follow him on the social media platforms and watching his interviews, watching his speeches, his lectures. And I'm just like, okay. And I listened to him outline his plan for the black community here in America, starting with the school. At the time, he was promoting the idea of building a residential academy. And this academy, he said, would have uh, a handful of different types of sciences that are taught, including agricultural science, to teach people, the children, how to grow their own crops. You know, of course, it would have the core curriculum, like the math and the history. Um, but for this particular school that he's building, you know, the whole emphasis is on teaching children their heritage, right? And instilling a sense of African pride uh, and ownership, right? Taking back the ownership of who we are as African people, a very uh, strong and empowering race, right? Reconditioning our minds in such a way that we're not just passive people, uh, kind of just floating through life, right? But we can walk through life and assert ourselves and take back what has been taken from us, right? What we were stripped of when we were brought against our will to this country hundreds of years ago. So I definitely felt empowered by that piece. Um, 
which was the core of his mission in building this this uh, African centered academy, right? And uh, the the academy was kind of like going to be the base of his mission, right? But surrounding that, he wanted to build something similar to Black Wall Street, where it was a community, a community that stood on its own two feet, essentially. So not only did it it would be it would be a community consisting of its own educational uh, school system, but also you know our own bank, right? Grocery stores, hospital, right? Kind of like our own black utopia on American soil. And I'm like hell yeah, especially coming from the mind that I've always had, right? I've always kind of been this person thinking freely for myself, navigating the world freely, independent thinker. It aligned with who I am as a person, right? As a black woman that, you know, even though I live in America, right? I'm very much detached from American ways, these Western ways, so to speak. Right. So I'm just like, hell yeah. It kind of gave me a sense of hope, much like how we felt when Barack Obama got elected. Y'all remember the excitement back in 2009? I was just like, oh, my gosh, finally, we got a leader that is going to pull us out these dark places. Right. And, And give us some aspiration, something to cling on to. You know, and then we saw a lot of other black people kind of rising with this sense of hope. So we develop a sense of camaraderie and unity with this unified front of what we could do together, what we can become as a black community, right? It's almost like this transformative thing, uh, this transformative experience was taking place. Remember back in 2008, in 2009, when Obama stepped on the scene. So me coming across Dr. Lamar Johnson and listening to his vision, his ideas for where he wanted to take Black America was so inspiring, right? And then I moved to Los Angeles in 2016. Of course, I grew deeper my affinity towards Dr. Mark Johnson grew deeper and I'm just like yes this is it and then I you know began to see how obviously with the mission comes a lot of hatred a lot of people trying to tug away right um from the mission and looking at his response he didn't always have the best response you know but who am I to judge Right, because like they say, to whom much is given, much is required, and that's not an easy feat. That's not an easy feat, kind of holding yourself in a humble, yet, uh, you know, you, you, it's it's a difficult place to be in. I think, you know, because on one hand, of course, he is this fierce lion, like he has the spirit of Ogun within him. But then on the other hand, it's like he has to maintain a sense of humility in the face of a lot of people who are following him while he's going through these adversarial attacks on social media back in, that was what, 2014, 2015, when, you know, the whole Tariq Rashid versus Dr. Umar Johnson thing happened and then Dr. Boyce Watkins stepped on the scene, right? It was just a whole big mess. Um, they were going back and forth at each other. Dr. Umar Johnson's father was, you know, in the mix and questioning him publicly saying, oh, what have you done? You haven't done anything. He was just owning his son publicly. And I still was standing by Dr. Umar Johnson's side, not privately, but publicly, publicly promoting my support for his mission 
and for him as a person, as a, as a black conscious leader. With that, I received ridicule and I started getting attacked. And even his father was on my YouTube videos coming, you know, speaking very vile things. And I said, you know what? I'm an adult here. You know, and this is the thing. This is the reason why I am. Sometimes I wonder, like, hmm, why don't I have a massive following? Why, why is it my following as big? as I kind of expect it to be. But then I sometimes take a step back and look at things objectively. And I'm like, I know why, <laughs> right? Because I think it's like once you cross over into that, that sphere, that space, we're all being controlled. But it's a whole nother level of puppeteering, I think, when you think you have a sense of... Um, more power than what you really have right on social media you have this following right you're really being puppeteered at that point is you're not you're not really the leader that you think you are and me knowing myself i already know it's going to be an assassination because i'm not folding i'm not giving in i'm just not i'm not bred that way you know it's like you, you fight for what you're willing to you fight for what you are willing to believe in, what you believe in, or you just die. All right? You're not gonna sit up here and try to save face and no, it don't it don't work that way. Not where I'm come from. And so it's like I, going back to when his father would, you know, leave comments on my my videos and, you know, say things like, oh, you asked him, what has he done for the black community? Da, 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 da. And so I say, listen, we can take this offline because I'm not the one to sit up here and be fake and phony and try to do things for show and going back and forth. I'm not, <laughs> I, don't, I don't do things like, I don't move like that. Uh, so that's when he reached out to me. We exchanged contact information. His father called me and we had a whole long, like multiple hour conversation by phone. And then that's when I got to see, okay, what's really happening behind the scenes. And it was sad. I honestly was humbled and I was sad to hear the reality of it. It's just like, you know, this shit is deep. It's like, you know, on this on the surface, people see one face of black consciousness, you know, black leadership. But then it's a whole nother world behind the scenes. That's often what's not talked about because there's a muzzle on people's mouths. And it kind of ties into this whole topic of Dr. Umar Johnson no longer being a threat. Yes, he was a threat, especially with the fierceness that he came out with, the energy that he came out with when he first stepped out. Not to say he don't have that energy, but I think it's slowly dying down. I remember the metaphor that a good friend of mine gave to show how with the black power of fists he says the black community is like that fist right and when we start out that fist is, is is held so tight the fingers are folded in and we have the thumb supporting all the four fingers right we're holding it tight we're, we're bound together as long as this fist is closed very tight it can do many great things powerful things transformative things but then over time as the wind the rain and things begin to take course things start to happen that fist slowly starts to take a different shape it starts to loosen up and before you know it those fingers aren't so tight anymore. It's not holding so tight to form a fist anymore. It's opening up. And 
Dr. Lawrence Johnson is only one person. And I know with his sense of diligence and pride, he, for a very long time, has thought that he can do it by himself. You know, and people have been telling him, no, nah, man, like, you know, take some help. You know, he received a lot of, I would say, constructive criticism online, which he took to be negative criticism. When people are asking, okay, where is the school, right? It's not really hate. Think about that. The enemy is not going to ask about something that should happen. If the school is meant to be and the school should happen, we need schools like the FDMG Academy. Do you really think the enemy, these crackers, is going to ask, oh, when is the school opening up? They don't care about that shit. They don't even want the school to open up. So the people asking that are holding you accountable. They were holding him accountable. He didn't see it in that way. It was very clear that he was a cause of his own demise, right? He, like, sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. And I think his own character flaws. And this is not my first time talking about this. Like, I did a whole video, the psychoanalysis of Dr. Lamar Johnson. You guys can go check that out. I broke it down very eloquently uh, several years ago when I was living back in Los Angeles of how, you know, of course we all have our own character flaws. We all have our weaknesses, right? But how with Dr. Mark Johnson, his weaknesses come at his own detriment and are his biz biggest obstacles for him being able to bring his mission, his vision to fruition. And one can say it's self-deprecating, but on the other hand, it can also be a protective mechanism too. Because, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it kind of gets tricky because, yes, we are naturally wired to survive. I always say this. I've said this before. It's just like in an ideal world, we are not having to fight racial oppression. We're not having to fight, you know, just to have a place in society. That's not natural order. But on the other hand, given the context of our society and the reality of what things are, naturally, one should have to fight. One should be driven to fight. It's called self-preservation. Right? And, and it can be looked at from both perspectives. It can be self-preservation not fighting and just giving up the fight. And it can be self-preservation fighting. And I think for Dr. Lamar Johnson, he's done both. You know, he started out with fighting to preserve the race. But then over time, I think he's the fight is slowly sleeping away. And granted, we have to just be practical about things. He's pushing 50 years old. <laughs> so at this point, it would have been ideal for the school to be open. And he's sitting back and he has got, you know, a whole um, caseload of people working for him. A whole payroll of people working. That's how things should be at this point. Not to say, I mean, think about it, you know, relatively speaking, 50 can be considered young. Because there are people seven years old still doing their thing, still making moves, right? And running organizations. I mean, look at our president. So it's not to say that it still can't come to fruition. But <laughs> when we're talking about the nature of his mission and the, the, other, the amount of attacks that he's under, is not no walk in the park. And he oftentimes talk about organization. We have to organize, organize, organize. But it's just like, mm, are you really organized? And I think at one point, and this is in the early stages of his uh, mission as a freedom fighter, I think he was very egotistical. I think his level of ego 
baptism is kind of coming to a, a, a decrease, right? Declining. But when he first stepped out, <laughs> he, had a, he had a swole, big ass head. And it was all about him taking all the shine, right? And him giving himself all of the, and yeah, you got to be your biggest, you know, supporter, right? Your biggest cheerleader, of course, right? But the level, the extent at which he did it, it kind of spoke to his degree of insecurity. Excuse me, guys. I'm going to sneeze, but it kind of spoke to his level of insecurity, right? Where he had to self-proclaim himself as the number one scholar and the number one this and the number one that. And it's just like, is that what it's really about? Is that what's really driving <laughs> your mission? Is that why you're here doing this? So that you could receive all the self-accolades, which become, you know, people praising you worshiping you is that what you're really here for you know so it often i think communicated to a lot of people who were initially in support of him it communicated a red flag like wait a minute who is this guy what is he really about but i think now that he's stepping more into um old age or older age shall I say like he's become a bit more humble he's still fierce I love that energy that fierce energy has never left that lion old goon energy hasn't left him but at the same time I think that you know that need for a stroking of his ego I think is um, naturally decreasing and he's becoming more conscientious and less driven by the need to have his ego stroke, which speaks to his maturity, right? So I think that's a good thing. Um, when he stepped out on the scene over nearly 15 years ago, and even just within the past, let's say, seven, eight years, I think, um, the white power structure was very concerned. <laughs> I think they took him very seriously um, when things were still relatively new, like the vision was still relatively new and very possible, more likely to uh, come to fruition. I think he was more of a threat because you think of how this vision could materialize and what did it mean for the black community? And what did it mean ultimately for white America? Because the two are inseparable, right? We are intertwined. So it makes sense why the white power structure, right? The powers that be has a close watch on what's happening in Black America. Notice, look, they monitor us and they reason that we're well researched. Whether we want to participate in the research or not, as Black people, as a Black community, as Black research participants, whether we are consenting to it, we are still heavily researched by white people. They have a close eye on us and it matters why. Why does it matter our um, literacy rate? In third grade, why does that matter? Why do you think that matters to white people? Why does it matter the ratio of black men, single black men to black women? Why does it matter to white people? Why does it matter what we do as a black community to white people? Why does that even freaking matter? It matters a lot because where we stand as a black community has a detrimental and direct effect on their own survival. We're intertwined. Now, you do have a group of theorists that would like to say, and I see who's watching, um, but there are a group of people who would like to say that white people no longer need black people, meaning 
if, let's just say hypothetically speaking, if it was to happen, all the black people, and I do mean all, here in America were to leave, do a grand exodus back to Africa, there are a group of people that say that would not have any kind of impact on white people, that white people here in America still would be able to thrive and live happily ever after, will be unimpacted. I don't think that's true because, I mean, just look at a lot of, um, look at a, a lot of the systems. Look at entertainment. I mean, it, every system, they depend upon us, not just the entertainment, even healthcare. Right, we make up a, a major contribution to every system that feeds white America, that keeps them alive. Even though we're at the quote unquote bottom of those systems, but the bottom people and those systems are the ones who are actually feeding the system, who are actually the workers of the system, the doers of the system, right? Without the doers of the system, the people at the top would not be able to survive. Thinking contextually about whether or not Dr. Mark Johnson and his mission currently as it stands now is considered to be a threat. No, I think it's become kind of weakened. And over time, uh, the probability and the possibility that it's actually going to manifest is kind of unlikely. Now, anything is possible, but I think it's highly unlikely because we're talking about a vision that was that he received over 15, 20 years ago. We're in 2023 and nothing really has materialized. Think about that. Now, granted, I am much inspired and I think not just myself, but many other people inspired by his uh, conferences that he holds periodically with uh, mostly single black mothers, a teleconference that he allows black mothers to call in to receive um, advice on their situation relating to their children, you know, who are often kind of called out of the classrooms and given IEPs and with that, you know, there's a strong chance that they could be recommended to take some type of psychotropic medication. So Dr. Mark Johnson sees that his role in that is to divert away from the labels, you know, these uh, stigmatizing labels that their cho- these uh, children of single Black mothers are often given in these school systems and, you know, protect them against the kind of brainwashing um, of how white America kind of wants to impose upon the minds of black children, right? Which is happening anyway. But I think Dr. Omar Johnson definitely has played a role in being able to divert away from that process so that fewer black children are misdiagnosed or mislabeled with a learning disability or any other type of stigmatizing disability that is often seen in the DSM, right? Which often accompanies these uh, very serious psychotropic medications that has long lasting detrimental effect on their brain structure, right? Once you take those uh, medications, your brain is forever changed, you know? Now, granted, for some children, depending on their symptomology, they just may need certain types of medications, but a lot of those medications that are prescribed or uh, recommended are unwarranted, and that's his whole point, right? So I think he has been effective in that sphere 
But in the grand scheme of things, for what he had envisioned in terms of a Black Wall Street, right, and building uh, institutions that will have forever life long transformative effects on the many different systems that Tariq Nasheed talks about in his Hidden Colors uh, 5 documentary series is like when you, you can even measure like he had this vision that would be a game changer for the black community I mean and this is scientifically proven in research to show how the system as it stands isn't really beneficial to black people. We're suffering. We're talking about uh, there is a racial disparities in healthcare, right? When black women go seek out medical treatment, not just black women, but black men as well, their concerns, their medical complaints are not taken seriously, especially when it comes to pain. And they end up risking death when under negligence. I see this even where I work. There are so many racial disparities, you know, there's, and that's impacted by racial bias, implicit or rather conscious, doesn't matter. It's still costly. And who has to pay the cost? We do as black people. We pay that cost of their ignorance or their deliberate racism against us. But if we were to build our own institution of healthcare and not just, you know, focus on having all black people because, you know, he talks a lot about what his uh, educational institution how he only wants to hire black staff, but it's not just the outer color that matters, right? You have to be black-minded. You can have black skin, but if your mind is white, that's just as dangerous. It's probably even more dangerous, actually. That's what we call black face. That's even more freaking dangerous because you're posing as something that you're not. You appear to be something that you're not. And, you know, that's a whole nother video topic that I'm going to come with. How there are a lot of white people walking around in black face. Black men, black women, and black children that will grow up to be black men and black women. Are so whitewashed. They're really white people and they're doing the work of our enemy so that white people don't have to come at us and attack us. We are doing it to ourselves. I look at black men and me being on a dating scene as a black woman, I'm interacting with black men and I get to understand their minds, see the way they think. I'm like, oh, this is even a black man I'm interacting with. This is a white man. It's much more dangerous. They have so much hatred towards themselves, towards a black woman. Right? So in building institutions that we want to say are black centered, they... I mean, and this goes back to that quote, Frederick Douglass, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men and women, right? We're talking about a reconditioning, reshaping, relearning, or unlearning of the mind. Thinking about all of the things that we have been wrongly, falsely taught. The, the information that we have taken in and that we continue to take in, especially that is at our fingertips with social media. The subliminal messages that we're constantly being bombarded with. 
via commercials, via this visual media programming that we voluntarily and involuntarily succumb ourselves to. That has, there has to be a complete undoing, a complete washing of the brain. And there are some aspects of this conditioning that I think are permanent, (laughs) that you can't undo. It's so deeply ingrained. It's almost like trauma, right? And we know the impact of trauma, how it affects us on a psycho-spiritual, neuro-bio-psychological level. It, it affects and changes our DNA. On a biological level. I mean, there's therapy to teach people how to adapt to traumatic experiences. But we look at the impact that it has had on our brain, or our mind, or our bodies. That's often irreversible. So then what do you do? How can you salvage and repair something that can't be fixed? It's irreversible. What do you do with it? That's what Dr. Umar Johnson began to say. Some people in the black community is going to have to wipe out. You can't save them. And you can't reverse the damage. You have to just get rid They're useless. You have to get rid of them. Right? And when he started talking like that, people really thought he was fucking crazy and insane. You know? But this is the truth. And I think it will be more helpful for people to really understand the direction of this conversation. Um by taking it to a certain context and looking at it through a certain lens that we are under war. We are in a freaking war, a race war, a war of our minds, a war for our survival. And when it comes to war, It's difficult to win in a war where we, as the oppressed, our survival is dependent upon um, the hand of a white man. How can you win a war when you have to get up every day and, and clock in and punch a white man's clock just to get paid money so you can buy food to feed your family? To pay your bills. To keep a roof over your head. Right? So tied into that. We're talking about financial independence. Which is one of the. Lessons. Which is one of the parts of his curriculum. That he's talking about. One of the subjects. Teaching financial literacy. What is financial literacy, right? It's all contextual. Financial literacy in America is not the same as financial literacy in a small town in Africa. So it's all relative. And the funny thing is, is like, even though his idea for his educational institution, the FDMG Academy, I think, very inspiring at the same time you are still recruiting people to be a part of this institution that you're just going to feed back into the system of white supremacy anyway so who's really winning in the end you're teaching them how to learn trades and it sounds good on the surface like okay you teach them right you gotta bring back the trades and teach them 
you know, how to uh, use their hands, not only their brains, but use their hands to work, to produce things, to build. But then once they graduate, they're going to be fed back into the system anyway. They're still going to be paying taxes, right? You're still going to be living by the norms, rules and laws of society, the same rules in society that have kept them oppressed, that enslave our ancestors, that told our ancestors that they are three-fifths of a man. That's why some people, they believe the solution is just leaving America. You don't want to freaking stay here. You don't want to abide by these these laws, these rules. You don't even want to live on the soil. Um, same soil that has so much karma, karmatic debt. But at the same time, Escaping, you know, the system thinking that you're going to go to another land, another country where it's going to be better. When, in fact, <laughs> the system that you're trying to escape is a global system. So then where are you going to run to? You're going to run to a whole another same system, another system. Which actually could be more detrimental to your survival. Planning is important. We've seen historically where black people on American soil, they didn't go no damn where. They stayed right here. They came together and they made shit happen. They got what they needed to do. Done. Because they, they did not let up. They did not give up. They did not give in. And they were a unified front. I just saw a whole documentary on this. That was so touching. So inspiring relating to education. How black people were not uh, allowed here in, in New York to go to the city uh, university college. They were, but not in the numbers that reflected the actual um, black population in New York. Like they were saying how um, they wanted, they fought for basically uh, inclusion in this college system. And they wanted the numbers to reflect, it's called the, the Five Demands. It was a documentary I just saw at the Schomburg Research Center in uh, Harlem. But they came with five demands, what they wanted, and they protested and they did uh they did a like a, a lockdown where they shut the whole university down. They didn't even allow the professors, no administrators, nobody, even white students couldn't even go to school. They shut that whole school system down because all the black people came together and they fought until they got their, their demands met. And I think the issue here is that we have become so complacent because we are given this false sense of inclusion where we think that, okay, things are good. We look at what we have, the tangibles, right? Um, income, we may have, you know, a nine to five job and we have an iPhone and we look at the things that white people have and we don't see much disparity. We're like, oh, well, we got the same shit they got. You probably got even more, you know, and you think that just because you're wearing Gucci, right, you know, you gain a sense of social status, which with that comes a sense of importance and inclusion. But it's a false sense. And with that, you feel like what need is there to fight anymore? Some would even go so far as to say that it's not even about race. 
The fight isn't a racial fight. It's not a gender war. This is a human war. That's a whole nother level too. I think it's it's all of the above. I think we're <laughs> fighting so many different uh, wars that things can become convoluted. And for some people, it's easier for them just to be ignorant to all of it. It becomes blissful to not have to think about the wars that we are fighting. As a matter of fact, it's like, why should we? Why should you have to think in that context when ideally and naturally you're supposed to just be able to exist? When we take ourselves out of the equation individually, right? When as a leader, a good leader, a good conscious leader, I mean, yes, you may be given the vision. You may be called to organize, but you can't be bigger than your own mission. I think that's what Dr. Mark Johnson, he failed. So while he's still going to go down in the history books as um, one of the most influential leaders that existed in terms of what he has actually been able to effect in terms of uh, substantial materialized change, I think that's still in question, you know, I think that because he is so obsessed with the recognition for himself, like he has become bigger than the mission, like, you know, his ego is much bigger than more important to him than the actual mission. Like you're going to get the recognition when the mission is fulfilled, right? But along the way, you know, he has become distracted by his own self, right? And his own need to stroke, have his own ego stroke, that he's become his own biggest diversion from the system. And I think that there are a lot of people that obviously have been rooting for him, you know, believed in the mission, such as myself. I still continue to believe in the mission, but I think that when it comes to bringing about something as massive as this mission is, like we definitely have to come together and to unite and I don't think it's enough of us. I think that that fist is a very weak, it's a very weakened fist, you know. Um, it's not even a fist anymore, you know. It's just like, <laughs> you know, it's barely even a hand. Um, so I think that for Dr. Umar Johnson, I think it's safe for him to realize that he's no longer a threat because when you think of it, it's a win for him. Is it a win for the black community at large? No, not necessarily because kind of looking at, you know, thinking about um, Marcus Garvey is just like what could have been, right? The whole back to Africa movement didn't really fully manifest, you know, was, is a good idea in theory. He had a very massive following as well, but these missions get intercepted. And I think that there, while it seems that, you know, one has no hope or we should give up, I think it's always hope. So that's just my thoughts. It is getting late. I do have to wrap this video up. 
But I had to express that and get that off my chest because I think that um, is like he's in a safe space. I think he's in a safer space now than he ever was. And they're not looking at him as a threat, especially with this whole uh, move that just happened with Sukiani. I think for him, he looking at it like, yeah, I influenced her. I got her. But if anything, no, I think she got his ass and she's definitely used as a puppet by the powers that control her. And she talked about this too. I saw a video clip. This was like months ago where she said she was feeling regretful. She was like, dang, I think I sold my soul. And if anybody know anything truly about Hollywood, some people think they know they've been exposed to it, but you don't know unless you know. It's like once you sell your soul, it ain't no reverse in that, baby. You're done. That's a done deal. And that's where she at. So for her, the rest of her life, I mean, is it behooves her to hell, just take those carrots. Take those millions. Continue to degrade black women. Continue to deface the black community with your music. Um, meanwhile, you know, you get to ride and nice cars and drive quote unquote expensive nice brand clothes and do photo ops with supposed conscious leaders you know um i think that that was a nice play <laughs> for her team that's controlling her you know every like and they used to make videos on this, but the funny thing, see, people don't know, like, I'm definitely a veteran when it comes to the internet and being exposed to, um, like, truth tellers, right, on the internet. But what a lot of people don't know is a lot of people got really, they got silenced. See, people talk about shadow banning on uh, Instagram and Facebook. But y'all have no idea. They've been doing this. And I remember when I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, back in 2011 to 2014, before I moved to New York, you know, they had, a, it was so many YouTube videos. It was like, and you know, I, I used to like be obsessed with it. It was a good obsession though. And watching these YouTube videos on um, the inner workings of, the system and what's really happening behind the scenes, you know, and it has so much information, but do you know, they banned all of that. Like Alec, people like Alex Jones, he was like, people just, you're talking too much, you know, a little bit too, too much. And they have to silence your ass. And you notice you can't find none of his videos on YouTube. I'm talking about the real trio videos back in the day where he was dropping jewels. That's classified information, man. People was releasing information that nobody should know about. It was him. It was a lot, a few other people too. I used to follow and I was just like, damn, none of those videos cannot be found on YouTube at all. Bad. They took that shit down. Only people, if only people knew. <laughs> if only people knew. And the thing is, is like once you know and it's out there, you wonder why people come up missing. Maybe it's no freaking surprise. So I think that people just choose their own life over the lives of the people that they're trying to fight for. You know, that's what Dr. Umar Johnson's father did. He told me that very explicitly. Like, listen, these motherfuckers trying to kill me. You know, so I'm like, okay, I get it. It makes sense why you would disown your own son. I have a whole, yo, I have a whole conversation that I make sure I record it. I make sure I record that conversation, but I have a whole, 
like two, three hour long conversation I had with Omar Johnson's father. And I have not released that. Um, I respect, but you know, it's clear. But yeah, people have no idea when it comes to Hollywood and when um, those it's like slavery all over again. And in the videos I used to watch, they used to those um, truth tellers laid it out. The inner workings of uh, Hollywood. People like to sell conspiracy. They want to say it's a conspiracy theory. You ain't no fucking conspiracy. This is true. This is how shit go down. And it's like, I lived in LA for four years. Two of those four years, I lived in Hollywood. I seen for my goddamn self. They tried to sweep my ass up. I said, oh no. <laughs> I am not taking this bait, but it looked very promising though. I mean, when you say yes, it's just like, okay. But then I had to make a decision like, hell no, I'm not going down that road. People think shit is a joke, but it's just like when we hear people talking about this, nobody nobody believes it. They're like, ah, oh, this person, they just making stuff up with their conspiracy theories. It's like, nah, buddy. On that note, I'm going to catch y'all later.